the weirdest gas station in northern Pennsylvania. Note that I am not a native English speaker, and ironically, this is the second story where being multilingual has somehow helped me. I recently drove from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Buffalo, New York with my cat. The ride was long, but we were making decent time for the most part. She and I had gotten up toward right before you got into New York. It was around 5.30 p.m., but that also meant it was pitch black out, too. We had only stopped once to get something at McDonald's, and I drank their iced tea quickly to try to stay awake. I definitely had to pee. I didn't want to leave my cat in the car, so I put her leash on, and we walked into the gas station. I said, Do you mind if we use the restroom here? The man behind the counter said, Sure, and she and I entered into the bathroom. She sat on the counter while I did my thing. The store wasn't empty. There were some dudes around browsing for honey buns, tasty cakes, and cheaper cigarettes than those in New York. There was a woman talking to the counter guy up front. She was probably like a regular based on their seemingly familiarity with one another. My cat jumped about a foot when we heard the doorknob rattle. I laughed and said, Sorry, it's occupied right now. My cat is a trained animal. She is trained to handle people, stimulating situations, crowds, and relatively loud noise. She hates cars, though. I looked over at her after the jump, and her tail was as full as could be, and she got low and slipped into her favorite position on my shoulders. She dug into my hair with her nails and did the little grumble at me as she does when she wants to be let outside. The doorknob rattled again, and she reached out towards the door, like in a quick way, like a strike. It's still occupied, I called out, but I wasn't laughing this time. We then heard someone speak. It was a man's voice, and honestly, it kind of made my blood run cold. They were speaking a cousin of my native language. English is not my first. They were saying, should I grab her when she comes out? And in my native tongue, grab doesn't really have the multiple connotations like it does in English. Let me grab them before they go. I have to ask them something. Grab a bite to eat, grabbed by the hair, etc. They used what was similar to take as far as I could tell through the door. No, the cashier is right there. We can go stand outside. I think her car is the blue one. My cat did her angry grumble bug sound and I tried to pet her to reassure her. There weren't any windows in the bathroom and my car was parked unwisely around the side of the lot. I parked it a little away from the lights because I had a lot of stuff in it and I didn't want the items to be lit. It was not the blue one. We heard their steps retreat and we sat there for what felt like a long time. We both jumped when we heard someone knock on the door. Come out quickly and my girlfriend will lead you through the back to your car. They are standing out by the pumps. It was counter guy and who I thought was the regular. I opened the door and she ushered me to the back. Not smart, but I didn't know what else to do. She opened the door and I could see my car about 20 feet away. I wanted to sprint, but I remembered I used my key thing to set the alarm. I unlocked the car with my keys and the alarm went off. I have deep cuts from my cat from this. Sorry, madame. I threw myself into the driver's seat, unlocked it with the key thing, and quickly pressed the button to lock it again. I felt my heart in my throat as I threw the car into reverse and got the fuck out of there. On my way out, I noticed the guy standing near the blue car on the other side of the lot. 
trying to nonchalantly smoke. They didn't even know I got out. Weird persons. Let's not meet. Edit. Here's my cat. My dumbass almost became a statistic. So I got kind of drunk last night and my friend had to drive us home. We were both having bad nights anyway and things got heated. In my drunken stupor I decided to get out of the car right along the freeway. I figured I would just go to the Burger King across the way. It looked open. It wasn't and I instantly got a bad feeling. I got there and ordered an Uber. My friend called me and insisted she come back for me. She's a great person and friend. I agreed, but when I get drunk I like to wander. I cancelled the Uber and started walking out to the middle of the parking lot. That's when I saw one of those 90s minivans, forest green, beige interior, creeping up on me. I started backing away towards the light. He swerved and started speeding up, his tires screeching. I pissed my pants and started running towards the busy street. He parked the van, got out, and started fucking chasing me. I started running at every car, desperate trying to get their attention. No one stopped. I finally saw a car with five cholos hanging out in it. I ran towards them panicking, screaming, Please don't freak out, I'm being chased, he's gonna get me, help, I have a phone, I will call the police, but don't leave me. They stayed. I am very thankful to them, even the guy nervously giggling in the passenger seat. A cop coincidentally pulled over a drunk lady dressed as a cop and let her go to assess my situation. My friends came back for me right on time. The guy was trying to slowly drive his van back around the Burger King. The cop went after him. I went home and smoked weed. Don't know what became of that creepy guy in the van, but I'll be on high alert for him now. My friends and I may have been in serious danger. I made a post about this same location almost a year ago. A friend and I were going to a haunted bridge, according to legend, and we were tailgated by four cars. Last night, Friday the 13th, my friends and I wanted to do something spooky for the occasion. I mentioned the bridge and they all seemed pretty interested. None of these friends had ever been before, so I thought it would be a really cool experience for them to hear the history of the area. There were seven of us, so we had to take two vehicles. When we made it to the bridge, it was about 2.30 a.m., Yes, I know it's not technically Friday the 13th anymore. We immediately walked under the bridge to where the legends say there are rituals and cult gatherings. We stayed under the bridge snooping around for about a half an hour, and then we decided to check the other side. As soon as we made it under the other side of the bridge, we began hearing a loud and constant splashing sound in the water. One of my friends was convinced it was something swimming towards us because it sounded like it was getting closer. Finally, we decided it was time to get out of there. When we make it back to the top of the bridge, a car slowly approaches us from behind. Being that it's so late and people are unpredictable, some of my friends started to run, but I was finally able to convince them to act normal. 
The car passes us slowly as we walk up the road to where we parked our vehicles. The mysterious car then stops right next to our car and stays there. At this point, we don't know what to think. The car just waits for us and we just kept walking. Finally, the car turns around and speeds past us. For a moment, we feel better because we thought it was leaving. But when we turned around to check, the car had stopped again and began turning back around towards us. We speed up our walk to get to our vehicles and the mysterious car slowly crosses the bridge in our direction again. I was in the car with five of the seven people. The other two were in a separate truck. As the car makes its way to us, it stops right behind where we were parked on the side of the road. As we attempt to start our car, another mysterious vehicle speeds past us and begins to slow down at the top of the hill that was in front of us. It seemed as if they were trying to surround us. Our friend in the other vehicle pulls out and slowly passes the car that was waiting behind us. The mysterious car then switches into reverse and started chasing our friend's truck while driving backwards. My friend gets away without much trouble, but now we are facing this vehicle head on. We start making our way across the bridge, and the strange car positions itself in the middle of the bridge, blocking our path. At this point, we decided we were going to continue going straight, no matter what. We turn the car to the left, and the mysterious car moves to the left. We turn to the right, and it turns to the right. Finally, we faked the car out, and we were able to pass them quickly. When we made it to the end of the road, our friend was waiting for us. He didn't know the area so well, so we rolled down our windows to discuss where we were heading next. As we are talking, another completely different vehicle turns right past us and starts honking its horns at us. We finally decide on a direction to go. About 10 miles away from the bridge, halfway home. A totally different truck speeds up next to us, flashing their lights and honking their horns non-stop. It would speed up in front of us and then hit the brakes to let us pass, and it would repeat that cycle until it finally decided to turn off. We made it home at 4 a.m., and we have yet to figure out what happened there. Edit it turns out I actually have a different group of friends who went to the bridge earlier that night. They claimed to hear the same splashing. They also claimed that they heard noises of people talking in the woods. They left immediately. We were completely unaware of this when we arrived. My friends have just begun planning another trip to the bridge, possibly during the day, just to sort of look around. We plan on bringing a gun next time, just in case. That one roommate. This happened earlier this year on the last day of August. I had just come back from spending the summer at my home and was gearing up for another year of school. My girlfriend and I drove back from the airport and we were coming into the student complex where we lived. Standing outside smoking is this man, Toby. Neither of us liked Toby very much. He had been living in the downstairs apartments last year and had been really creepy to one of our floor mates, Sarah. So creepy that he had been banned from the upper floors. So we mostly ignore him. Toby, however, never lets a chance to socialize pass him by, so he says hello and tells us that we can't get inside. This is because the doorknob is missing. Weird, but the building was only renovated into a student complex the year before, and it was kind of trashy, so we didn't think anything of it. I put the doorknob back on as Toby wanders down to the end of the walkway, to yell obscenities down the street. 
that's a little worrying because even though Toby is kind of creepy, he's not violent or overly aggressive. We slip inside, think he must be drunk, and settle in to go to bed since my plane got in late and it's around midnight. Sleep, it turns out, was impossible. Toby, in a rage, is yelling and carrying on. He comes in and out of the house. It's never locked. We live in a very small town and students keep forgetting their keys so no one ever locks up. Banging doors and stomping around. Now most people moved out at the end of the year and we're not even sure Toby lives here anymore. We decide it's fine. He'll tire himself out. He's not hurting anyone. Just ignore it. About an hour and a half later, Toby is still at it, but now he's outside our window. We're on the side of the building that is next to the other building, as opposed to looking out onto the driveway or the garden. And next door, they're turning that building into more student complexes. Toby is banging on the chain link fence, swearing about his house right outside our window. At this point, both my girlfriend and I are concerned for our safety. The yelling and banging are incredibly violent and show absolutely no signs of abating. So we go out and lock the doors and call the police. The police take a while to arrive, but Toby is disturbing the peace so they have a talk with him, tell him to quiet down, and go to bed. They come and talk to my girlfriend who called them, and they leave, telling us to call back if things keep up or get worse. This is the end of it, we think. For around 15 minutes anyways, everything is quiet. Then Toby discovers we've locked the doors. He is not happy about that. The yells of obscenities laced with, this is my house, my house get louder and louder. He goes back to beating up the chain link fence and yelling down the street at drunks coming out from bars, but mostly he's outside our window. Then there's a brief silence followed by the sound of shattering glass. Toby threw a rock and broke one of the windows in the room next to ours. Had he been one window over, it would have gone straight into our room. We called the police again, now very scared for our personal safety. Luckily for us, however, Toby stopped throwing rocks at windows after that, possibly because the windows are about a story off the ground. The yelling and the banging at the chain link fence and the front and back doors didn't stop though. Not until the police came and took him away. We saw him for a few days later after we learned that, in fact, he did not live in the apartment anymore, sitting on the grass by the driveway on the phone. He gave us the worst look when we got out of our car. Luckily, I haven't seen him since, and I'll be happy if I never run into Toby again. Epilogue. The government is pressing charges, but who knows how that will end.